I cannot begin to tell you how happy I am to be here tonight. My name is Gary Segura. I'm the Dean of UCLA Luskin School of Public Affairs. And on behalf of UCLA, I want to welcome you to, to tonight's Luskin Lecture event, Black, Brown, and Powerful, Freedom Dreams in Unequal Cities. This event highlights the innovative research supported by the Institute on Inequality and Democracy, which is part of the Luskin School at UCLA. The stories you will see tonight and hear tonight and the performances you'll witness are part of the Luskin School's Luskin Lecture Series which is intended to enhance public discourse for the betterment of society. As always, we express our gratitude to Meyer and Rini Luskin, whose endowment gift made this and so many other things possible for us. The Luskin School is home to three public-facing departments. I want to emphasize that, public-facing. I like to say that the Luskin School of Public Affairs puts the public back in public higher education research institution. We do so because the types of work that we do in public policy, social welfare, and urban planning brings the tools of social science into an applied setting to actually address and work to solve important social, economic, and political problems. The mission of the UCLA Luskin School of Public Affairs is to develop not only areas of research that identify advanced solutions to society's pressing problems, but also to cultivate graduates who have the capacity and inspiration to work towards effective change. We are very proud that when our students leave us, they go out into the world as leaders and change agents in nonprofit organizations, government agencies, and private businesses alike. I'm also unbelievably pleased to announce that this fall, we will expand our programs to offer undergraduate students a brand new major in public affairs. It is the first large scale new major at UCLA in about a generation. And at Build Out, we expect to have 600 undergraduates digesting the tools of research and analysis and the theories of structure, institution, economics, and social change so that they can engage in the communities from which they come to make the world, their world, a better place to be. It is certainly my hope and my goal that in a few years, the public affairs major will be of special interest to community college students interested in transferring to UCLA. I want to thank LA Trade Tech College for providing a home tonight for the Luskin Lecture. When I became the Dean of the Luskin School, one of the first meetings I took off campus was with Francisco Rodriguez, the Chancellor of the LA Community College District. Now I'm proud of what we do at UCLA and I'm proud of what we do at Luskin. But the LA Community College District each year educates 265,000 students. And that's where the real work is done. So I'm hoping this evening marks the first of many opportunities for partnership with the district and with LA Trade Tech. At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce LA Trade Tech President Larry Frank who has a long history with UCLA. Larry moved to Southern California to work for the United Farm Workers Union, si se pueden, <laughs> followed by work with the Amalgamated Clothing and Textile Workers Union and the Communications Workers of America. In the 1980s, he led the Jobs with Peace Initiative, voter-sponsored signature gathering efforts that placed two initiatives on the 84 and 86 citywide ballot. He attended UCLA from 87 to 90 and received a degree from the law school, so he's a Bruin. <laughs> then developed a private legal practice through the 90s that focused mainly on alternatives to incarceration. For example, helping to organize Prop 36, which prioritized drug treatment over the foolish policies of incarceration. Our Luskin faculty, interestingly and ironically perhaps, continue to research and teach the very effects of that sort of policy reform. 
Larry was staff and research director for the UCLA Center for Labor Research and Education, and it was under his leadership that the downtown UCLA Labor Center in MacArthur Park was established. This was followed by major positions with Mayor Villaraigosa, including deputy chief of staff. He was eventually recruited to become president of this institution because of his many years in workforce development with this college and elsewhere. In effect, his labor aspirations were merged, were fused together with another great passion, higher education. So it's my pleasure to welcome and thank LA Trade Tech College President Larry Frank. Welcome to Trade Tech, everybody. Uh, so uh, if uh, the Luskin School puts the public back in education, we like to think that we put the community uh, back in community college, right? So, so you know, i just tell you a little bit about where you are, for those that you don't know Trade Tech. Uh, this college is uh, 93 years old. Uh, it's the oldest of the community colleges uh, in the uh, community college district. Uh, Chancellor Rodriguez brings his greetings to you. He's up in Sacramento. He'll be back, but he's going to be joining you guys tomorrow. Um, so here of our students, we have 25,000 students here at Trade Tech. Uh, it is um, of the uh, student population. Uh, probably have about, uh, I think it's right around 1,100 DACA students. We have uh, 700 former foster youth. We have uh, the largest EOPS program uh, in the state. Uh, it is uh, probably about 2,500 of our students are reentry students. Uh, we do, uh, that's who we are. We know exactly what we're doing in terms of working in this population. Uh, Shamari Davis, a big partner here, IBW, we've probably gotten uh, 600 folks into joint apprenticeship from our construction program. We have a big partnership with the Anti-Recidivism Coalition, kind of moving that piece forward. Uh, we have, uh, it's the only majority male community college of the 114. Uh, I say, well, why are you proud about that? Well, it's actually, you know, community college isn't exactly, you know, if you go to Southwest College, you'll find out that it's 76% female, right? So we actually, it's primarily focused on the fact that we are a career technical education uh, focused campus. 70% of our, our classes are in constructions, main utilities, advanced transportation manufacturing, in health and related sciences, in applied sciences. Uh, and uh, we have a full liberal arts. It's a full community college, comprehensive community college, but 70% in career technical education. And we like to think that this is the place you come uh, to get the good jobs in Los Angeles. Deeply connected with labor, uh, which is key to organizing business to actually make it accessible for folks from the inner city. So we do really interesting work here. Uh, one thing I just wanted to add to the equation uh, is that uh, two years ago, a number of the organizations, many tourists among them from CD Tech, our partner, uh, came to Trade Tech and said, we need you to, to um, apply for a promise zone for South Los Angeles. There was one in central LA, but there was not one. And it gives you preference points to be able to apply for federal, uh, federal grants. And it was a, a huge piece of work. Manuel Pastor, where are you? Was our thought leader. Manuel, wherever he is, he's going to raise his hand you know, somewhere over there. OK. Uh, was a huge thought leader to help us go down this road. Um, but we're able to be able to bring a promise zone to South Los Angeles. And the work is kind of focused on a strength-based understanding of South Los Angeles. And the strengths really are several, but we focused on the amazing uh, richness of the community, uh, of all the community organizations in, in South LA. We focused on the schools in South Los Angeles. We focused on the new transit, the new mobility of South Los Angeles, where you can take the Expo line and Blue Line and get to the number one job market downtown, get to the number four job market down in Long Beach on the Blue Line, or the number two job market on the west side with the Expo Line, or the number um, five job market out at the airport with the coming Crenshaw Line. And we are able to also look at almost like a perimeter around South Los Angeles. If you look at how the Blue Line 
and the Expo line and the coming Crenshaw line sort of operates, where there are 15 fixed rail transit stops where you can have additional density to make sure that when the transit-oriented development comes, that it's not just about creating islands in South Los Angeles, but creating opportunity for South Los Angeles with the project labor agreements, with the community benefit agreements, and with the partnerships who really know how to step up and help us figure out these pieces is South LA. But there is tremendous passion and brilliance in organizing that's happening in this town. Uh, and we are very, very proud to um, host uh, the Luskin School today uh, and also tomorrow. We'll get some of our students here with you guys tomorrow. Uh, and uh, we just wanted to take a moment to um, let you know that you are in friendly territory and you have a longtime uh, partner here if you want us. All right, welcome everybody. I got to introduce one more person. So the executive director of the South LA Transit Empowerment Zone, our South LA Promise Zone, is Effie Turnbull Sanders. Would you please stand up just so you can identify who you are? Where are you? She was here a momentary ago. Anybody? No? Okay. So Effie, she'll be here tomorrow if she's not here today. Thank you very much, everybody. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I'm Ananya Roy, Professor of Urban Planning, Social Welfare, and Geography at UCLA, and Director of the Institute on Inequality and Democracy at UCLA Luskin. <laughs> so go ahead. Along with Christina Barrera and Jocelyn Gihama, my two colleagues at the Institute, I join Dean Segura and President Frank in welcoming you to this event, Black, Brown, and Powerful Freedom Dreams in Unequal Cities. Some of you will remember that two years ago, we inaugurated the Institute on Inequality and Democracy with the theme, Urban Color Lines, highlighting the dispossession and displacement underway in cities, here in the United States, and around the world. We gathered at the Japanese American National Museum, Pete White was there, with social movement leaders from Los Angeles, Chicago, Rio de Janeiro, Cape Town, to remember that the forced removal of people of color is part of long histories of settler colonialism and racial separation. And we took note of the urgency of the present moment, of black and brown community communities being pushed out of urban cores to peripheries and margins. We called it banishment, racial banishment. Analyzing racial banishment is an important part of our research agenda at the Institute on Inequality and Democracy. So in the talks this evening and in the workshops tomorrow, you will hear about the intricate and interlocking processes that make up racial banishment. Evictions, gentrification, the financialization of housing. Did you know, for example, that in the San Francisco Bay Area, a family with two workers, each making $15 an hour, with a yearly income of 62400 which sounds pretty decent, can afford the median market rent in only 5% of the Bay Area's neighborhoods. And those neighborhoods are at the far, far edges of urban life. This is a finding from PolicyLink but this is not just a Bay Area story, it's a nationwide story. As housing movements have reminded us time and time again, the rent is too damn high. And at this event, you will hear about the criminalization of poverty, the policing of the houseless, 
policing in our schools, legally imposed spatial exclusion, the deepening of deportation regimes. Did you know, for example, that Los Angeles County operates the largest jail system in the country at a cost of $1 billion a year? As the Million Dollar Hoods Research Project, which is based at UCLA, reminds us, this perverse investment in human caging targets a handful of neighborhoods, those that have already experienced many decades of redlining and marginalization. And it is not just that carcerality is disproportionately focused on black and brown communities, it is also that carcerality has become a means of economic extraction. So tomorrow you will hear from researchers at the UCLA Labor Center and at the UCLA School of Law about the ways in which these forms of economic extraction must be understood as what they call institutionalized theft, which takes the form of poor paying jobs, criminal justice debt, and the foreclosed futures of system impacted youth. So racial banishment is not just about the dispossession of resources and land. It is about the dispossession of personhood. Abolitionist geographer Ruthie Gilmore reminds us that racism, and I quote, is the state-sanctioned production and exploitation of group-differentiated vulnerability to premature death. And indeed, premature death haunts our cities. Today, we stand shoulder to shoulder with colleagues in Brazil, and at the request of our graduate students, we remember Mariela Franco, extraordinary political leader assassinated in Rio de Janeiro earlier this year. We joined the statement by US black feminists on the imperative for transnational solidarity in the face of rapacious global capital and interlinked state violence. But it is from that place of transnational solidarity that we seek to build freedom dreams. We borrowed that phrase, freedom dreams, um, from our rock at UCLA, Robin D.G. Kelly. Freedom, Robin notes, is an integral part of the black radical tradition and its global imagination. So equity, yes. Inclusion, yes. Justice, of course. But freedom, freedom returns us to the unfinished work of what W.E.B. Du Bois called black reconstruction. Freedom returns us to what Anibal Quijano has called decolonial thinking. There's an old song from Kendrick Lamar that has been on my mind recently. Kendrick Lamar was recently awarded the Pulitzer Prize for music, a first for hip hop. And are we not glad that some other hip-hop artists did not win that prize? <laughs> Titled Determined, some of you might know the song, this 2009 song is about getting out of Compton. It's about making it. Go get her with no cheddar, just a white tee and a swap meat sweater. My life is likely to see great endeavors but I can't win if I can't get it together. What I gotta do in order to see success? Having the world's best to call me the best. And there's a line in that song that now has even more ironic meaning than what Kendrick Lamar had perhaps intended in 2009. It goes like this. I don't want to be a dealer. I want to be a Trump, Donald that is. Determination and success, yes. Being the best, yes. But freedom dreams, those are something else. But whose freedom dreams and which freedom dreams? So this evening and tomorrow, you will hear about the freedom dreams that we strive to support through research and teaching. Tenant unions, debt collectives, abolitionist planning, lyrics from lockdown, 
Educational reparations, underground scholars. Who is the we, though? The university? But whose university? I'm very proud that I've spent my entire academic career at the University of California. But I've spent much of that career fighting the canons and practices of the elite public university. And I see my students smiling at that. At the Institute on Inequality and Democracy, we are certain that university-based theory and research has a role to play in transforming unequal cities. But we are equally certain that that role can only be meaningful when it is in humble partnership with social movements and community organizations on the front lines of struggle. So we are here in this beautiful space so generously provided by LA Trade Tech here in South LA because we know that it is here in South LA that there are fierce struggles for self-determination, for black and brown power, for resistance in the face of banishment. To be here means not just being here physically, away from what I like to describe as the manicured enclaves of whiteness on the west side of LA. To be here means to challenge the whiteness of canonical knowledge. So J. Cole just dropped an album. You know I'm going to talk about J. Cole. And that album has a brilliant song called Brackets. If you haven't heard it, you must hear it. J. Cole raps about a curriculum that tricks us. He says, one thing about the men that's controlling the pen that write history, they always seem to white out their sins. To dream of freedom means challenging and changing who controls the pen. It means refusing to white out the sins of obscene wealth and racist power. It means getting serious about a people's history and a people's city. That, above all, is key to this event. Black, brown, and powerful, freedom dreams in unequal cities. Thank you for being here this evening. Please join me now in welcoming Paul Ong, Professor of Asian American Studies and Urban Planning and Director of the Center for Neighborhood Knowledge at UCLA. Okay, good evening. Uh, good evening. Good evening. <laughs> thank you. Okay, I want to thank Professor Roy and the Institute for supporting our work at the Center for Neighborhood Knowledge. Uh, we conduct data-driven research to understand the dynamics of regions and communities to examine what progress has been made and to identify challenges before us. Tonight, unfortunately, I am the bearer of bad and hopefully a little bit of good news. But before I talk about our findings, let me take a minute to introduce myself. I do this at the encouragement of my staff who believe I should talk about me, not as an academic, but me as a person. I am the son and grandson of illegal immigrants. My staff said I should use undocumented immigrants, but my Parents and my grandparents had documents. Unfortunately, they were not legal documents. <laughs> MacArthur Park, if you want to go. <laughs> I first grew up in Sacramento's Chinatown before it was urban renewed. As a matter of fact, thinking back on that history, it is urban planning that was such a destructive force about where I spent my first seven years of my life. Then we moved to the only place where my parents could buy a home, and that was Oak Park in Sacramento. For you, those of you who do not know Oak Park, it is the African American neighborhood back then and still is now. 
I participated also in public protests, much to my mother's chagrin. I remember I got a panic phone call one evening from my mother, who said that her friends called her up because they saw on the evening news a protest march where they identified me being in front. <laughs> it is this personal history that both informs and motivates my work. And the most recent uh, work that's done by my colleagues and my friends and my staff is this report. And I believe there are copies back there if you don't have it. On the 50th anniversary of the 1968 report on urban unrest by the Kerner Commission, we released an analysis of South LA over the last half century. In many ways, the 60s was a pivotal period. Um, how many of you guys were alive remember the 60s? That's kind of frightening. <laughs> It was a decade, an era of social and political unrest, and maybe I over-romanticize it, but certainly it had these elements, mass protests against unjust war in Southeast Asia, the counter-cultural revolution, the second wave of feminism, and the emergence of minority power movements. This culminated in a remarkable set of accomplishments. And we should not deny them. This includes the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, the 1965 Voting Rights Act, and the 1968 Fair Housing Act. It was also the same period we saw the enactment of the 1965 Immigration Act, which finally ended nearly a decade of discrimination, racial discrimination, against people of color. It ended that practice that made my parents, my grandparents, illegal in this country. The hopes and the dreams that came out of this victory would be one that we would usher in a progressive transformation towards greater social justice. Yet, for every action, there is a reaction. Okay. I learned that in physics, Okay, like being a good Asian-American students, my parents wanted me to go into STEM. So I actually minored and majored in physics and math. So I learned that for every action, there's a reaction. But politically, that's a reality, too. So Los Angeles, California, and now the nation have witnessed a backlash by those who feel their privileges and positions were being attacked. This took the form of voter approval of the 1964 Anti-Fair Housing Initiative the 1979 anti-school busing proposition, the 1994 anti-immigrant initiative. What started in the Golden State did not stay within California, but instead has mushroomed or trickled up to the nation as it is manifested by the Tea Party, anti-Obama rhetoric, and Trumpism. South Los Angeles is a lens through which we can assess what materialized during the five decades. In this report, again, there are copies back there, we track changes in four critical areas, employment, housing, transportation, and education. What we find, in my opinion, is both disturbing and deeply disappointing. Unfortunately, there are many signs that far too many of the hopes and dreams of the 60s have gone unfulfilled. Let's first look at the labor market. Today, a worker in South Los Angeles earns only 62 cents for every dollar earned by a worker in Los Angeles County. In other words, less than two thirds, even when working full time, full year. The disparity is even greater in the housing market. We all know the American dream is home ownership. And home is where is the most important asset held by a typical American. But housing wealth for the average South Los Angeles household is less than half of that for the typical Angelino. 
most South LA families are relegated to that rental market where, as you already heard before, the rent is too damn high. There are also enormous disparities in accessing regional opportunities. Today, South LA residents are twice as likely to be in a household without a car in a metropolis that's built around the automobile. It's great to hear about the public transit that we have, the new subway systems, the light rail. The truth of the matter is still we're not there. And it is a city that where you don't have a car, you don't have access. Finally, there's a glaring disparity in educational opportunities. Today, the academic performance of elementary schools in South Los Angeles ranks at the bottom. And this hasn't changed over a half a century. If you went back and look at the McCone Commission report, that's the California report and the aftermath of the Watts riot, it ranked South Los Angeles schools at the bottom. It still ranks at the bottom. The deep consequences of this educational inequality is inevitably an intergenerational cycle of poverty. South Los Angeles remained economically marginalized through unfair and entrenched institutionalized practices based on race, class, and place. Within the context of persistent injustices, it's no wonder that this community exploded in urban unrest in 1965 and 1992, and maybe in the coming years. There is, however, some good news, so I don't want to leave you with all bad news. It is important to note that there's been improvements, and we could see it. There is, for example, the Martin Luther King Jr. Community Hospital. There are far fewer liquor stores. Although policing is still unfair, and unjust, we are at least trying to move towards community-based policing. And finally, we have seen an explosion of elected officials of color. It is equally important to note that the gains have come through struggles by community organizers, political activists, labor leaders, and everyday citizens. The most important lesson coming out of the last half century is to renew a commitment to forceful confrontation against the powers and structures that produce and reproduce inequality. It is necessary to mobilize against racism and economic injustice. As Martin Luther King Jr. once stated, freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the press. Like the 60s, today's strategy must be multi-pronged multi-dimensional, and multi-community. The tactics must range from nonviolent civil disobedience to militant actions. It must take place during public debates, at the voting booth, via social media, and on the streets. It should be guided by a vision anchored in historical accomplishment and adapted to current realities. It is our wish that the university be a partner in this struggle. And you must hold us accountable to do what we do best on behalf of the larger agenda. Thank you. Please welcome now to the stage, Tony Roshan Samara from Urban Habitat and Right to the City Alliance. Tony joins us from the Bay Area and from the very midst of tenant organizing and housing justice struggles. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me in the back? It's good. I'll talk a little louder then. Um, so my name is Tony Samara. I work at Urban Habitat in Oakland, California and I'm also on the National Steering Committee for the Right to the City Alliance, which is a national alliance of base building groups around the country fighting for housing justice. 
And I want to talk to you a little bit about the tenant movement and the movement for renter power. So I've been involved in the Bay Area fight for tenant rights for about four years now. Um, and looking back on this, I sometimes wonder how rent control became the center of what is now a massive statewide and even national movement led by working class people and people of color. And in 2013, we had to make some decisions at Right to the City about our housing work and specifically about renters and gentrification because we were told the recession was over, the housing ownership market was rebounding, and there didn't really seem to be much interest in housing justice. But what the leaders of the organizations in Right to the City were saying was that the housing crisis in their communities was escalating, that rents were going up and they were going up fast, that displacement was spreading. It was spreading to places outside of the big urban markets. It was spreading to small cities around the country in new states, and it was spreading to the suburbs. So we made the decision to double down on housing. And in 2013, we launched the Homes for All campaign. And in 2014, we released our report, Rise of the Renter Nation, to make our case for why we were doubling down on the housing justice movement and the fight for renter power. And over time, we decided that the focus of our campaign would be rent control. And I should add that when I talk about rent control, as many people who do this work do, we're actually talking about rent control and just cause eviction protections. We see both of those as separate policies, but as necessary cornerstones of the housing justice movement. So after 2013, a year later, I moved to Oakland and started working at Urban Habitat. And my first assignment in that job was actually to work in the city of Fremont. And if you haven't heard of Fremont, it's the fourth largest city in the, in the Bay Area, and it's also home to the uh, biggest Tesla manufacturing plant in North America. And the project I was sent to work on was an affordable housing project. There was a new BART station being built, a train station, and they wanted to build 4,000 units of housing around it. And I was sent as part of a campaign to try to increase the percentage of affordable housing around that uh, new development. So I started meeting with community organizers. I started going to community meetings. And pretty much what we were hearing across the board was, yes, of course, we want more affordable housing, whether it's at the train station or any place else. But what we, really, what we really want to talk about is rents. And what we really want is rent control. And so that was a really important lesson for me. And it was an affirmation of the decision that we had made at Right to the City, what we had been struggling over in terms of what the direction of the Homes for All campaign should be. And it answered this lesson for me, the question of why rent control has emerged as the flag around which tens of thousands of people are rallying around across the country and around the state. And so there are two interrelated reasons here that I wanted to talk about. First, people can see that rent control has real, immediate, and broad impact. It's hard to imagine the emergence of a mass movement of and led by working class and low-income people that doesn't do this. Just to take one example, last year the city of San Jose, the biggest city in the Bay Area, passed Just Cause. It already had rent control. Right after that policy went into effect, about a few weeks after the council passed it, 400,000 residents, 400,000 renters were immediately protected from arbitrary evictions. The second reason is that rent control begins to challenge the supremacy of property and profit in a way that's rooted in people's lived experiences. If we're gonna build a long-term housing justice movement or a housing movement that is embedded in the broader struggle for social justice, we need to confront the commodification of land and housing. Rent control fights are a way to start and to advance that discussion and to struggle for transformative solutions on a mass scale. Nothing exposes the brutal logic of the market more than an $800 rent increase for a senior on a fixed income or a 60-day notice for a family to leave their home, no explanation given. And when that logic is unleashed, as it is here in the US on a national scale, you create the conditions for a rebellion. And that is why 400 tenant leaders from around the state met last year in the city of Alameda 
It's why almost a dozen cities across the state, including many here in Southern California, are taking rent control to the ballot this year. It's why statewide repeal of Costa Hawkins will be on the ballot in November. And it's why hundreds and it's why hundreds of tenant leaders from around the country will meet in Atlanta in July to build a national movement for rent control and for housing justice. Thank you. It is indeed an extraordinary moment of tenant organizing. Please join me now in welcoming Manuel Criolo. There are many ways in which I can introduce Manuel, but I'm so very proud to be able to introduce him as the scholar activist in residence at the Institute on Inequality and Democracy. What's up, y'all? How you guys doing? This crowd's getting the sun, I see. Uh, probably be time to drop that one out. Well, I'm a person who, uh, as y'all know, I like to talk, so I'm going to time myself so I could, you know, I could do it right for y'all and everybody here. Um, all right. Well, you know, first thing that we have to, if we are fighting for a city, if we are fighting the inequality the city faces, we have to face the racial inequalities of a city, we have to first think about the diagnosis. And the first diagnosis is that we live in an occupied city, an occupied city that has been almost 400 years in of making, under Spanish rule, under Mexican rule, and then over the last, last 150 years, you know, U.S. rule. So, when we think about that then, if that's the broader war, we have to think about what's the battle that we're fighting now. And that battle starts really here in South Los Angeles um, because violence, erasure, displacement, poverty, and co the contestation of the city itself is happening here as one of the major sort of battlegrounds of the city. And when we think about freedom dreams, we also have to think about what that means, you know, full shelter for people, jobs, um, you know, um, really, people can, people even dream. And one of the spaces to dream is going to be the schools. And schools themselves are being contested. Schools themselves, it's one of the last places that we have. This is beautiful, beautiful that we have Trade Tech, that we have UCLA, that we have LA Unified, but those are also under contestation of being taken over. And that really is the battle that we're confronting right now. And that's what my talk about today is about the work that I've been doing for the last 10 years, if not longer, um, around one aspect of trying to fight for the space of education. I've mainly been doing that around the struggle around policing and punishment in schools, but it's tied to a broader fight for the right to an education, to the right to have public schools, the right to think about and really claim why we have public schools in the first place. And um, I think when we have to do that, you know, we have to think about what's really in, in front of us. So just a little bit about myself. Again, I was born and raised here in L.A. I am a product of L.A. Unified. I am old enough uh, to be one of the desegregators of schools. I actually, my home school was uh, Vermont Elementary. Y'all have Vermont and Adams right here. And uh, funny enough, my mom moved us out going to Pico Union. She's like, South LA is getting a little rough. Let's go to Pico Union. I'm like, yo, Pico Union, you know, I don't know if it's any better. <laughs> but um, I was bust out of the schools, you know, here in LA Unified, instead of actually improving the schools in the inner city, they, what they decided was to push us out, grab us on a bus and put us out to the valley. So, you know, I had the uh, luxury of going to Irwin Street Elementary in Van Nuys, and then more, most of my most... Um, horrible and, and unmemorable years was at Hale Junior High and El Camino High School out in Woolen Hills. If y'all from there, good for y'all, but it wasn't for me. And, you know, the tracking system in there was so alive. You know, while it wasn't 
you know, Manuel, or it wasn't Belmont, uh, it wasn't Fremont. You know, there was many ways that both the subtleness and the violence that we confronted in that school was also very real. And, you know, I was uh, probably too moody. Um, I'm still very moody. And, um, you know, m much of my anger is really inside. And I remember that my disposition was not for rebellion, but there was a lot of self-hatred. There was a lot of self-loathing. And, you know, I always say this, that, you know, it was Malcolm X that saved my life. Because when I read him, it changed my life in many ways. And while I'm a virtual dropout, and I'm actually a product of L.A. City College, too, um, really, books saved me, and ultimately, the movement saved me. And I want to talk today about the L.A. Unified School District and the L.A. SPD, the Los Angeles School Police Department. Who's ever heard of the Los Angeles School Police Department? All right, good number of y'all. Well, one, L.A. School Police Department is the largest, oldest, dedicated police department in the country. Um, and over the last 10 years, we've been doing work, I've been doing work with the Strategy Center and the Community Rights Campaign uh, with students from Boyle Heights, South LA, and West Valley um, to try to really end the punishment and policing um, apparatus at LA Unified. That is, is not just about the school police department, but it also includes the LAPD, LA sheriffs, the juvenile, juvenile court and probation uh, systems, um, and of course the LA School Police Department, and where thousands of young people were being ticketed and arrested in school. And LA Unified then is a really a good important center for all of us to figure. And one of the things that I want to really try to push today is this idea of educational reparations. Now, why educational reparations? Well, for me, educational reparations has to start from the position of us understanding that really um, the real crime that has confronted a lot of our people has been the crime of policing, criminalizing, punishment, and the school to prison pipeline. And as I laid earlier, the different players that our young people are confronting in the schools, um, and we look today, even today, when we look at the, yesterday, the uh, Office of Civil Rights of the Department of Education just released new information. They said basically there was 2.7 million suspensions handed out in 2015, 2016. Um, the good news, 100,000 less than the year before, that black boys who represent only 8% of all those totally enrolled in school in 2015-2016 were 25% of those suspended, 23% of those ex expelled. Black girls who are made up only 8% of all the students accounted for 14% of all the suspensions, 10% of the expulsions, and now it gets even worse. The number of students being referred to law enforcement actually has gone up. About 290,000 students uh, were referred to for, were, were either ticketed or arrested in the 2015-2016. Um, again, almost 5,000 more than the year before. And that the data show, of course, not surprising here when we think about the long history of this country of, of enslavement and anti-black racism, that, that, all, that the data also showed that black students, only who, which only represent about 15% of all the total students, they get about 31% 30, of these uh, tickets or arrests. And the disparity is 5% higher than that was in 2013 and 14. Now that makes you think about, well, why? If there's been so much activism around the school to prison pipeline, a lot of important work that's being done on the ground, how is the number going up? Well, one, we could explain that obviously one good thing about the movement is that we've actually forced the cities and the schools to actually report the data. So the first thing we understand that there's actually more real total numbers of what we understand as the reality on the ground. On the other flip side is that much of the reforms that we've all have had have only struggled around trying to limit the role of police and not trying to, and, and not even thinking about how we're gonna remove police in schools. And that's really the core of my sort of uh, time here at, at UCLA has been looking at a deep dive about how did police come into schools? How did LA Unified become, how did LA Unified have the largest school police department? Did you know LA Unified School Police Department is the fourth largest police department in the county? It is the 13th largest in the state. It's got almost over 500 police officers and security guards. Um, it is really a center of carceriality of the city and, and of the country. And I, oh man, see, there we go. That my time is gone. Shoo. All right. The good thing is I, that was only for, I got two more minutes. Um, um, so I'm gonna go through quick. 
you know, I have a, I've been playing this seven-part song about how we got police in schools. First part, 1948, that's when we first got our first police in this city, in, in LA Unified. It was started off as a sort of night watch, but it's still, we got to think about the context of the 1940s of the anti-Mexican, anti-black sort of sentiment in the city, the anti-communist sort of sentimentality of the city, and that in many ways, the, the center of schools became a center of contestation. The other one was in 1965 when the first uh, officer in school actually appeared, which was after the L.A. Watts Rebellion. Uh, and of course, the first uh, police officer was at Jordan High School. The third piece, my third part piece of the song is the 1968. Now, this is the 50th anniversary of the, of the walkouts, the 50th anniversary of the um, major battle on manual arts and at Jefferson High School, where there was also a ma major uh, protests and actions. Of course, the first police departments, then the first uh, police presence in police then began to expand as counterinsurgency to a lot of these uh, young people who were in the schools. Um, the, the, fifth, the fourth part was the desegregation movement in, in, of the city itself, of the schools themselves, as the call for moving young people from the inner city to the outer, outer city of the valley, we start now seeing that the excuse of violence, right, of white violence toward students also expand the apparatuses of policing in our students. The fifth part was that the state actually sues the LA Unified School District in 1980 for what they saw as disorder in the schools. And George Duke Majin, who eventually became the governor, who became the, uh, really the, the, uh, the, the great, great keen of, of prison expansion, was also the keen of actually expanding police in schools. And in 1982, Prop Proposition 8, we were talking a lot about propositions here. Proposition 8, which was viewed as a, a victim's rights law, uh, expanded into having the guarantee of security in schools. And the idea was security could be interpreted as anything, but of course, in a state like California, it was interpreted as putting police in school and deputizing police. And so I wanna end with this idea, but we need to really think about the idea of educational reparations in the context of removing police in schools. Because if we only, if we only remove the, 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 the damage that happens today or in the future, what about all those young people who've gone through, who are no longer young, who've gone through that system? And how do we think about a repertory justice for our schools to really bring you know, the healing that our communities need and more importantly, to really be, to, to center ourselves into a real freedom dream for our city. Thank you. Thank you, Manuel. And now please welcome to the stage, Lola Smallwood Cuevas, director of the Los Angeles Black Workers Center. Well, I'm going to use my timer too, Manuel. Thank you. And thank you, uh, Ananya and the Institute uh, on Equality and Democracy for inviting me this evening and for all of you for being here. Um, I am one of the co-founders of the Los Angeles Black Workers Center. And the Los Angeles Black Workers Center is a grassroots action center located on 54th and Crenshaw. Um, and it is a place where uh, workers are coming together and showing great courage um, to address what is um, a devastating jobs crisis um, here in Los Angeles. Workers coming together, standing together, and contesting what is a compounded crisis, a dual crisis of unemployment and underemployment in LA. But in these zip codes that are surrounding uh, this campus, what we see is that nearly 50% of black working age adults are either unemployed are working in uh, low-wage jobs, earning $15 an hour or less. When you have a situation where you have over half of a community that is in such a crisis, you wonder what makes black workers continue. How do you think about ways to contribute to your community? to care for your children, to participate in the political process, to be able to um, articulate your gifts to society. How do you feel like a full participant in Los Angeles? And is Los Angeles a place where black workers can still be and thrive? Those are some of the questions that black workers are struggling with 
um, every day. And I, I want to start with the solutions because we all know the situation of a crisis, and I'll talk more about the history and why it is. But I want to say that this crisis was really created by people, by a set of values, um, that are built in a neoliberal uh, reality that has removed quality jobs from our communities and that have created a situation where workers are dealing with instability, are dealing with um, the lack of resources that they need to be able to take care of themselves and their families. But at the same time, black workers are resilient and have hope. And I'm inspired by members uh, like Trina Trailer who recently led a march uh, down, downtown LA, and I see Black Worker Sitters, and I see Trina there, who recently led a march downtown Los Angeles fighting for stronger employment discrimination protections. Trina was a hardworking mother who raised a daughter, stitching together two and three jobs, um, trying to, to make ends meet. After she did that hard work, she decided I'm gonna go back to school, get her degree from UCLA, and be able to have an opportunity to have the career that she always wanted. But yet she's still struggling with unemployment. Why? Because of a girlhood mistake that remains on her record, and employers will not give her an opportunity. I think about other members like Steven, who leads our Ready to Work mentorship um, program with other construction workers. Coming from immigrant roots, he settled in Los Angeles with a wealth of construction skills. And within two miles of his home, there were $9 billion worth of projects, building stadiums, building roads, building rails. But yet, Stephen was not able to get a job. And in fact, he teetered between homelessness and despair, and that is not right. That is not what a world-class Los Angeles can look like, but that does not stop black workers from recognizing that this is not an individual crisis, that this is a crisis that was engineered and manufactured by a system that will have black workers believe that the reason that they are unemployed, the reason why they're underemployed, is because of their decision making. And at the Worker Center, what Trina and Steven and hundreds of other workers do is come together and realize that this is not their making. That their experience, that they that their experience that they that they see on a daily is rooted in an enduring legacy of US racism and anti-blackness. It's combined with public policies and social norms and unconscious bias that say, though you might want to work for the city now as a black worker, that you have to be life scanned in order to be able to have a job. Let's say you've worked for the city for 20 years. Now you need a college degree to be able to keep your job. It's institutional practices in industries like the construction industry and other blue collar jobs that is all about turning their backs on black workers that have said, in order for you to do this work, you need to be able to do this work in isolation, to do this work alone to be able to be what we call the Little Rock Nine effect, to go onto a construction site and to be the first ones to integrate those construction sites, to work hard, to prove yourself, but all the while to do this while you're standing alone and on your own. These practices, these biases, these norms have created a perfect storm of growing disparities for black workers. And it's requiring us to transform a civil rights framework that said, well, we could build rights that will protect workers to create a more equality, to create more equality in a more equal society, to being a civil rights framework that is just about defending black life and opportunities for black women, black men, and the democracy as a whole. The suffering caused by these disparities 
here in Los Angeles, where we have this incredible crisis of unemployment and underemployment, looks the same as it does in other parts of the county, in spite of Los Angeles' size, its robust economy, and its position as a pro-worker, progressive city. A recent study by the UCLA Labor Center and the Los Angeles Black Worker Center says that the social and economic har 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 hardships that black workers are experiencing has pushed black worker population out of the city by about 100,000 residents in the last 15 years. And if you go back another 15 years from that, about 250,000 residents have moved this area and relocated into places like Riverside and Moreno Valley. This is an economic push out of black workers. This is a banishment of black workers. Those numbers don't just correlate to uh, a decision of migration that workers are doing on their own. They correlate to the 250,000 good jobs that left South Central Quarters over a generation ago. And these, uh, these, these, outs these outsourcing of jobs, the breaking of unions, the disinvestment in South LA as a whole, are creating these geographic shifts that are concerning in what is the second largest city in the United States and the 12th largest black population in the nation. When you factor in children who are born of both African American and uh, Latino descent, we have the second largest black population in the country. And so what happens to black workers in Los Angeles is a generative conversation. It's generative not just for LA, it's generative for black workers across the state, it's generative for black workers across the country. And what is happening to black workers? What are the conditions? Black workers in Los Angeles are more educated than they've ever been before which really blows the myth away that the whole issue and the need of black workers in this region is that workers need training and that that is the primary economic development strategy for black workers. The research shows that black workers are more educated, hold twice the number of bachelor's degrees than they have in the last 10 years and have narrowed the high school diploma uh, gap from 30% to less than 9% right here in South LA. Yet despite these gains, black workers still earn three quarters of what white workers earn. Despite those gains, black workers are still relegated to frontline positions that are low wage and have no ladder for supervisual or, or managerial um, opportunities for higher wages. Despite those gains, black families in South LA still have, have only a nickel of wealth when compared to the dollar of wealth of white families in this county. So what does it mean when we have this situation in our communities, when we see black workers in this crisis of unemployment and underemployment, when we see the stagnant wages um, and the lack of opportunity, we see vulnerability to incarceration. Consider the recent statistics that were produced by Million Dollar Hood Project um, that is a part of UCLA led by Ka Kelly Lytle Hernandez. In a recent forthcoming, uh, in a recent report that is gonna be released in, in forthcoming, she reports that 33% of workers arrested in recent years were unemployed black workers. How is it that 7% of unemployed workers make up 33% of those arrested? and that those arrests generated $84 million in bail. We can't figure out how to create good jobs in our communities, but our people are creating $84 million to fund and fuel their own bondage. Something is wrong. What does it mean for our ecosystem? And for our ecosystem, I mean the relationship between working class black folks and black middle class folks? What is the tension that happens when you have working class communities in this crisis and you have uh, about a third of black workers who are middle class in unions and their jobs also be threatened? 
A recent executive order from this administration, which is an example of the rise of white male elite supremacy in this country that has had an agenda to dismantle and disrupt and destroy worker power since the New Deal, has issued executive orders for right to work, removing the opportunities for worker to organize, and unionization has been a vehicle for success and opportunity for black families. Most recently, we now have a Janus decision and this is a critical issue. As we think about the crisis that's happening around our working class communities, we also now have a crisis for those working middle class communities that have made up the black radical base, middle class base in Los Angeles as the Janus decision threatens to weaken union bargaining rights, to remove the opportunities for unions to collect dues, and to undermine the opportunities for for our communities to have the necessary resources to fund progressive initiatives like Prop 30, to put the necessary resources back into schools, to have campaigns like the Raise the Wage to increase minimum wages to, to, to a living wage in the city of Los Angeles. And worst of all, this decision threatens directly black women Black women who are the benefactors of decades of organizing to be able to have equitable representation in the public sector. This is a twofer for the administration, wiping out workers and removing the last leg of the economic uh, stool for black middle class communities by destroying the public sector union. And so when we see the attack on public sector jobs, know that it's attacking black women who have been supporting and providing services in our communities. So for Los Angeles, how do we understand the need to elevate and prioritize black workers? Why is this important? What is it that we must do to understand that at 7% of the population, black workers are 40% of those who are houseless? And in fact, the only black census tract that gained black population in the last census was Skid Row in Los Angeles. What do we do when black men and women make up 45% of the jails? And when we die 17 years sooner, than any other group in the county for preventable diseases. It's like the canary in the mine analogy. The, carries, the canary's distress, which alerts the miner to the poison in the air. The state of black work points to a deeper condition in our society and in Los Angeles. And we must know that in order to move the needle on these conditions, that we have to elevate and prioritize addressing the economies of black Angelinos in a real way. That if black workers rise, then LA rises. And so that means a new organizing framework that focuses on building power and defending and protecting black workers. In Los Angeles, what that means is we have to talk about black. We have to say black workers. We have to say it's okay to speak black workers. We have to leave terms like people of color back in the mythical days of a post-racial society where it belongs. We need to say immigrant workers and their conditions, women workers and their conditions, LGBTQ workers and their conditions, and we must add black workers to the conversation so that we can interrogate, examine, explore, and see what are the, 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 the trends, what are the conditions, what are the imperatives that are creating these conditions for black workers. And when we do that, we invest in creating space and place and opportunities for black workers to come together, to share their experiences, to learn together, to analyze, to develop strategies, and to put an agenda based on that knowledge on the table of a broader social justice movement. We want to see how do we center black workers we have to organize and ensure that black workers organize the gender at the center of our tables. 
And that's what we've been trying to do at the Black Worker Center. First, building black workers black, back up, ensuring that black workers' are, needs are addressed when they're the last hired and the first fired, when they're terminated because they stand up for their rights, when they're left to work in isolation and unsafe conditions, or when they experience wage theft. As a community, we have to be there to say that is wrong. We have to provide the resources and tools for workers to come together and to develop solutions and to be able to move those solutions. We need to monitor and educate our employers. We need to educate employers on what it means to hire black workers, to understand the job crisis, to create the necessary supports that will ensure that black workers are successful on their jobs. It's not enough to have race neutral policies like local hire. It's not enough to have race neutral policies like disadvantaged workers language. What we have to do is be able to develop a, a system of support, of strategic outreach, of coordinated monitoring to ensure that workers are not let, just gaining access to projects, but that workers are retained and that they stay on the project. That means we have to mandate diversity. We have to deal with policies like Prop 209 that have made, who, that have outlawed diversity, that have made it basically a crime to require that black workers be part of the workforce in a real way. And we have to address the protections of workers at the state level. We have to move policies that address the issues of employment discrimination. The Los Angeles Black Worker Center is engaged in a campaign right now called Local Enforcement Now. And the campaign, again, comes out of the experiences of workers. As we see the department, uh, uh, civil rights department at the education department close down at the federal level, as we see the civil rights department at the Department of Labor be consolidated, as we see the EEOC uh, being defunded, our members began to ask the question, well, where do black workers get protection? How do we ensure that there is necessary enforcement here in Los Angeles where discrimination happens for black workers to address it? And so our members created a, black, a coalition called Black Workers United that brought unions and community civil rights organizations and faith organizations to stand up and fight for not just raising the wage, not just for collective bargaining rights, not for traditional labor protections, but that are targeted racial, race, racial justice initiatives that can better protect workers in the workplace. And this campaign met a lot of opposition it met a lot of opposition from legislators who questioned, well, who are community members to want to change the ways in which employment discrimination happens in our state? But that did not stop our coalition and our members from doing tremendous research, from telling powerful stories, from educating legislators, and showing the ways in which the state system has a two-year delay for complaints that are filed with the Department of Fair Employment and Housing. They talked about the lack of communication when they've experienced discrimination and getting information back about how to address their issues. We talked about the ways in which the conservative leadership of the state in years past defunded and dismantled the civil rights infrastructure meant to protect workers and that our families fought for and died for. And we talked about the resources that are lost when black workers lose hours and opportunities to work in our communities. And in the end, the in this campaign, we marshaled 
a coalition of strong unions to stand with us. And it was the first time that unions got involved in a fight that was about the issues of civil rights and not necessarily the issues of labor rights. And that's the strategies that we need to employ, more opportunities for folks to come together, to be able to strategize together, and to capitalize on the power of labor and the power of our communities to make change. And in the end, the local enforcement campaign was able to move forward and we now have an advisory group that is working with the governor's office to develop steps for workers to be able to file their complaints here at the city of Los Angeles where discrimination happens. For the city of LA to join 40 cities across the country that are in fact protecting workers' civil rights. And we think that that is going to impact over 400,000 workers in Los Angeles um, and increase the number of 100,000 workers who filed complaints last year to many more who we know are out there and did not get the support and the help that they need. These are the kinds of strategies we need to be involved in. Building power, building coalitions with unions and workers and community, ensuring that there is a racial justice focus and lens on the work that we are doing on the ground so that there are wins, not so broadly for the full, uh, for, for all workers, which is, which is extremely important, but also that black workers don't fall through the cracks and that black workers get the support that they need. Black workers have freedom dreams, and in Los Angeles, they're making those freedom dreams a reality. And they're doing that by building power, building relationship, and making the demands that are necessary to address the black jobs crisis in Los Angeles. Thank you. Thank you, Lola. Thank you, Lola. We're gonna have a slight change of format. Please join me in welcoming to the stage, Kathy Wooten, founder of Loving Hands Community Care and Georgia Leap, Professor of Social Welfare at UCLA Luskin and Director of the Watts Leadership Institute. All right, everybody, this is, this is the talk show segment of tonight. Um, hello? Hello? Okay, I got to do this. Since we're sitting down, I'm going to do this. Everybody stand up. You've all been sitting here. You've all read the data. We're not supposed to sit for longer than half an hour. Stand up. Stretch. Okay. And sit down and get ready. All right. And as Ananya introduced us, uh, I'm Georgia Leap. This is Kathy Wooten. I am going to let Kathy do most of the talking tonight for some very important reasons. She is a resident of South LA. She is also part of what we are calling the Watts Leadership Institute. And I want to start this discussion, and by the way, I want to encourage you to ask Kathy questions as well, but I want to start, don't make that noise, okay. <laughs> I want to start this discussion, number one, by saying there are many South LA's. We act as if it is just one area, and it is not. South LA is composed of many communities with cultures with a kind of DNA of their own. And the community in South Los Angeles that has been my honor to be a part of for the past 40 years, from the time I began my career as a very young social worker, is Watts. And Watts, California has a very, very strange, interesting, wonderful identity. When I say Watts, what does anyone in this audience think of? 
Towers, what else? Rebellion. Rebellion, what else? Housing developments or projects. Lack of clean water. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought you said. <laughs> Maxine Waters and lack of clean water. <laughs> What I, have also, what I have witnessed in Watts, and it is part of Freedom Dreams in every sense of those words, what I have witnessed in Watts is a thriving, strong, struggling culture that has been characterized as having deficits, as having problems, as having violence. And over the years, many, many groups came from the outside to tell Watts what it needed. And there were all kinds of leaders and all kinds of people who kept prescribing for Watts what it needed. But very few people, I won't say no one, very few people sat down and said, what is going on in Watts and what do the residents of Watts believe that they need? And there was an incredible story, excuse me, there was an incredible study, also an incredible story, that was completed at UCLA about a problem that characterized Watts and other areas that was labeled nonprofit deserts. Now that's a strange term. When we think of deserts, we think of aridity, emptiness, dryness, heat. But these were deserts where there were no local nonprofits that were thriving. Instead, the nonprofits came from the outside in. This is not to denigrate those efforts, but they were not efforts from within the community. There was no support for nonprofits in the community. And so what we began at the Luskin School was a project we called the Watts Leadership Institute. And we determined that we wanted to find the, find the funding to help fund and rise those leaders up. Not for us to tell them what Watts needed, but for them to tell us what Watts needed and what they needed as leaders in Watts. It was time to stop being prescriptive, it was time to learn from the grassroots up. Those are words that are used so casually, so easily, and it was time to put action to those words. The first cohort of the Watts Leadership Institute, and make no mistake about it, this is a 10-year initiative that we at Luskin have undertaken because the other thing that has happened in South Los Angeles in general, in Watts in particular, is the hit and run. And I don't mean the accident. I mean a funder or a program that comes in for nine months to fix things and then goes. A new program that is the answer to all problems that shows up and goes. We are here for the duration, and we are here to listen to and support the leaders, the community leaders, the residents, the people who are part of Watts. So it is my honor, my privilege, I am humbled. This is a person I can tell you I learned from every day of my life, I'm going to introduce one of the Watts leaders who we will be talking with for the next few minutes, Miss Kathy Wooten. Hello. Yes. 
Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, I started Loving Hands Community Care back in 2008 when um, my two oldest sons was murdered due to gang violence. And as a result of that, um, my oldest son was a mentee um, of Pete Carroll. And after their death, Pete encouraged me to start a nonprofit dealing with and serving families of murder victims, specifically mothers. And so my oldest son passed away in January of 2008, and my second oldest son passed away in March of 2008. And in May of 2008, I was attempting to put on a Mother's Day luncheon. Why, um, I still don't know how it all came um, together, but it did with the help of many people. And this year is our 11th annual Mother's Day luncheon. And we started off with about 25 to 50 women, and now we're over 200. Now, Kathy's work in, began with the Mother's Day luncheon. It, it began with two losses that I don't think anyone could imagine. However, that is where her work began. Loving Hands Community Care is a 501c3, a nonprofit, and I first want to have Kathy explain it does, it begins with the Mother's Day luncheon, but it does so much more. I want you to explain what your organization does and what you want it to do. After I started um, putting on the, um, the luncheon with uh, the help of so many wonderful people, I got a call from, um, at the time, he was Captain Tingredis of the 108 police station. Now he is the commander. Um, no, he's the chief, assistant chief deputy. And um, he asked me if I was um, interested in being an intervention worker. I didn't understand why at the time, but as time grew, I realized that it was because of the relationship and because of the boys that my sons were in the community that I'm able to even do what I do now and that is a gang intervention worker. Um, I work under the agency of SAIA, Solidarity Enrichment Action. And I've been a, a gang intervention worker now for about seven years. And um, so my life is my work, and my work is my life. And it's unfortunate that I had to do this work as a result of losing my sons, but that's where I am today. Um, there's one, there's another aspect of Kathy's work, and that is a support group oh, okay. that she has. The support group uh, is under the umbrella of Compassionate Friends. It's a worldwide um, agency that supports mothers, grandparents, and siblings of murder victims, or any way that a child dies. And so... Um, one of my friends took me to this support group and I was so taken with the compassion that the compassionate friends showed that I was wondering, we, doesn't have, we don't have anything like that in our community. And so I began to ask questions and um, I had to go to an orientation and now I'm a facilitator. And so we have a support group every last Tuesday of the month called Compassionate Friends at our local fire station in the city of Watts. All right, but you're a leader of a small nonprofit. What do you need? What does a small nonprofit need that you don't have? Funds. <laughs> <laughs> um, outside of that, uh, we 
we need small businesses in our community that our community members is running. We need grocery stores that sells healthy food. We need restaurants that sells healthy food. We need beautification in our community. Um, I've been there 52 years, um, born and raised. My parents was born and raised. Um, I raised six kids in Watts. Um, three of them is college graduates. One is uh, in college now. Um, and then my oldest two sons also went to college, but they also were gang members. And so as you know, I just said, as a result of that lifestyle, their lives was taken. So I do what I do because I don't want their lives to be in vain. You know, different people have their perception about gang members. Um, some good, some bad. Um, but they were individuals, they were humans, and they were good kids, they were good fathers, and they were good brothers and sisters, and they were good friends. And so that's why I do what I do, and I'm going to continue to do it until God take me away from here. We've got just a couple of minutes left. I'd like to invite at least one person from the audience to ask Kathy a question because this is the heart of community and systems change. Does someone have a question they want to ask? Yes. Did no, you? Okay. I didn't. I grew up in the surrounding area. Also, though, I did live in public housing at one time when I was a young mother, just starting out, um, but in the surrounding area, yes. There is definitely a willingness for change. Is there a change? Yes. Is there still a lot of stuff going on now that was back then? Yes. But um, over the last five years or so, there's been a tremendous change, and every day it's getting better. Yes. I also want to point out, Kathy is one of a cohort of 12 individuals that we have she is one person who is working to change the narrative. She represents and embodies the type of leader that must be supported, lifted up, encouraged, and funded. And the other piece of this is she is the type of leader who should not be driven out of Watts or out of South LA due to gentrification, due to displacement, due to extraction due to the lack of protection for black workers. All of the themes we're talking about today. Someone may say, why is it just one person? It's one person, what do they mean? What we look at through the Watts Leadership Institute, what Kathy and others in our cohort have taught us and continue to teach us is their story is the story. This is the meaning of community and systems change. Thank you all so much. Oh, I have a check. I come across them every day. And how I come across them is because I live with them. I live right there in the next door, across the street. Um, some of them is my family. Some of them is my uh, friend's son. So that's how. And, and I want to add, and, and I do, I don't want to go beyond our time. At least, one, I'd say three of the members of our leadership cohort are former gang members who have now re-entered mainstream society. And one thing I want everybody to know our research at UCLA has shown that individuals who are leaders, 
who are successful and effective in gang life, not violent, but who are leaders, have skills that translate very naturally right into mainstream life. I would also venture to say there's probably some people in mainstream life whose skills transfer quite e easily into gang life as well. And that's not to minimize the violence or the devastation that gangs create, but it is to also acknowledge and honor what Kathy has said and what the people of Watts who strive every single day to understand and to change. So now, thank you again and thank you for having us be part of this program. Thank you, Ms. Newton. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Georgia and Ms. Newton. Are you ready for a very special performance? I am actually delighted to turn this event and this stage over to my dear friend and comrade, Brian Bain, Professor of African American Studies, founder of the UCLA Prison Education Program, for a very special performance, Lockdown Unplugged. And at the Institute, we are also delighted to be able to welcome back the inspiring Maya Jupiter. The United States has the highest incarceration rate in the world. We are addicted to locking people up. Despite having only 5% of the world's population, the U.S. has 25% of the world's prisoners. The land of the free, it seems, is anything but. While we have been building a national consciousness around the causes of mass incarceration, little attention has been paid to one of the system's most powerful actors, prosecutors. A prosecutor, also known as a district attorney, represents the government in criminal proceedings against any person accused of a crime. They are actually referred to as the people because they are supposed to represent the interests of the community. Their job is to seek justice not convictions. And prosecutors have more power than most of us realize. Prosecutors alone decide whether or not to charge a crime. They get to decide who is prosecuted and who gets a pass. They also decide what crimes to charge you with. This is important because the more serious the charge, the greater the risk a person faces by taking their case to trial. This increased risk puts pressure on a person to give up their rights and take a deal, even if they are innocent. And despite their legal duty to turn over evidence that could prove you are innocent, prosecutors themselves, all in secret, decide when to apply that rule. Given all their discretionary power, prosecutors ultimately determine how the system treats the most vulnerable people in our communities. But the problem is not just the unfair amount of power prosecutors have. The problem is the abuse of that power, which is unfortunately all around us. Investigative reporter Radley Balco explains that one of the most powerful positions in public service, a position that carries with it the authority not only to ruin lives, but in many cases, the power to end them is one of the positions most shielded from liability and accountability. And he's right. Over 40 years ago, the Supreme Court gave prosecutors absolute immunity, a powerful legal protection that is even greater than the protection the law gives to police officers. Absolute immunity is a big deal, a really big deal. And it means that in our current legal system, who we elect to represent the people becomes even more critical. Here's what you can do. 
Find out who the elected district attorney is in your jurisdiction. Get to know where they stand on the issues you care about most. Make sure you know what policies and practices are implemented in your name every day. Hold prosecutors accountable with the power of your vote. It's time to ask whether your district attorney is standing up for the needs and values of the communities they serve. So, do prosecutors exercise significant power? Absolutely. But they can only exercise the power that you give them. And that starts with winning an election, which means the most powerful player in our system is really the voter. That's you. Wandering through the holy water of my mother's womb, I wonder what it would mean to be a man. And from the endless echo of estrogen exiting her glands, I gleaned a grave gospel. It came to me in a cryptic code that when cracked would key me into the corridors of my own unconsciousness. Many men will never know what it means to be a man, she said. For far too many fail to find the meaning of meaning. I was like, word. But what the hell does that mean? I was bewildered by the words I heard while waiting there within for having not yet seen the world awaiting me. I was unable to fit this in the focus of my mind's iris and yet somehow somewhere there within I saw what she was saying. Like the sailor sees the sirens through their songs, I saw my soul being sentenced to life inside this body, reincarnated to be incarcerated in this cage called flesh, released on probation only through meditation, but meditation was a Morse code made for men on the other side of the tracks in the arm of a heroine committing heresy against herself, and I was by myself in the womb like I was by myself in my tomb. I died free because I couldn't live life a slave, and now I'm back from the grave in a rage to get mine because I be divine. Say what? Said I be divine, not just some ebonic line. Check my EKG sign. <laughs> You'll see a circle, not a line, because I transcend space and time. I transcend space and time. I transcend space and send space. I send space back in time. I send time back home to recline. Ain't a damn thing they can do to hold back me and mine. We keep coming back like Roberta Flack on that Fuji's that I don't I'll be sure track. Sure, you can kill me soft, hang me on a cross, even cut my head off black. One time, no real loss, everything comes back. Black two times, better believe that. I'm the same spirit that put Goliath on his back with the stone in my sack way back. Black, now that's three, three black. Cause the Trinity is back Not just God the Father and God the Son Like Holy Mothers is ghosts Somewhere shooting smack Or barely dancing but naked on white supremacy's bloody lap For nickel and dime sacks Or little glass vials of that white powder crime The cops just can't seem to crack Talking about they don't know where it comes from Acting like they don't know where it's at Just like Uncle Tom as a matter of fact Cause he don't know where he come from Yes master? You don't know where he's at, yes, boss? So you don't know where he's going, master? Going, boss? Gone. Of the days when a blissfully ignorant slave celebrates the chains, trapping him in his Socratic cave as he breaks free out the cave he cannot see that we have always been and we will always be. Even our MCs go back before MCC. Numerically, that's 12th century AD for Age of Darkness. But in the Dark Ages, it wasn't we who were sparkless. We sparked it like an elder on flames in hell. Kept it bright, kept it right, kept even the Romans real. Because they was on that I, I, I shit while we was like one, two, three. Letting them know the deal. We were their light and sun, sun were their sages. Now we out here fighting to work for their minimal wages. And outrageous as it sounds, those who bound us adore us. As if Osiris throne were overthrown by young Horus. But they warned us before just check psychology text. Son kills father, Oedipus, Rex, complex, yes. But I was reincarnated to be incarcerated in this cage called flesh. So all the death can do. It set me free, and all the death can do is set you free, and all the death can do is set us free. Peace, family. Big shout to Naya. 
Jocelyn, Christina, the entire folks, folks at Luskin, the Institute, give it up for them for putting this together. Praise to the Most High. Honor to the ancestors, to the elders, the Tongva people, all indigenous people whose struggle we stand in solidarity with against colonialism, genocide, and slavery. We recognize their struggles as our own as we stand on this occupied land. Yes, yes, got to say that. My name is Breon Bain. Give it up for John B. Williams on the bass. Give it up for Click, the super Latin on the beats. Omo on the visuals, give it up one time. So from LA to Brooklyn, just look who's been invaded by aliens. Come to replace, we raise the homo sapiens. The human who can't reproduce all nations under attack by the new crack gentrification. On your own block, you get no respect from Jake. Out to exterminate apes on Section 8. See, your rent was late, so we sealed your fate. In correction of facilities built upstate. Uh huh, concentration camps in full effect. More police on the streets, what you expect. White folks and brownstones collect bigger checks. So, boys in blue break necks for corporate execs. Yes, the condos is coming like the colonies. And if you monkeys don't like it, you can swing. From trees, shot down to Oak Town, Philly to Fort Greene, east to west. It's the next manifest destiny. East to west, it's the next manifest destiny. East to west, it's the next manifest destiny. How y'all doing? Y'all all right? All right. <laughs> Wasn't planned, but it just had to be said. So we are. <laughs> we got to get into these things. Uh, we have a very, very special uh, guest with us today, and I'm just so excited that. My sister from another mist is going to be joining us in just a moment. Uh, so when I say black and brown, somebody say power, black and brown, black and brown. Power. Come on now. Y'all sound like y'all in Westwood. <laughs> when I say black and brown, you say power, black and brown, power. black and brown. Power. Give yourselves a big round of applause. That's what I'm talking about. OK, OK, a <laughs> little better. So I want to I want to share another piece before I, I bring my peoples up, and I just I had the opportunity to sit and bill with Albert Woodfox in the last couple of weeks, and Robert King in the last couple of weeks. Anybody know who the Angola Three are? Anybody? Round of applause. Make some noise if you know who the Angola Three are. All right. So these brothers spent 29 years and 44 years in solitary confinement. 44 years in a six by nine box in a prison that was created from four plantations, which at the end of the Civil War, when freedom, emancipation was supposedly won, the only thing they changed about the Angola penitentiary, the Angola plantation is the sign over the door, which made it the Angola Plan uh, Angola Penitentiary. So it went from the Angola Plantation to the uh, Angola Penitentiary. And when I asked Albert Wood Fox, the longest surviving solitary confinement man released in American history, what got you through? I said, what helped you to survive the trauma that you went through? Most of, most of us will never experience that, will never know what that's like. What lessons, what jewels do you have for us, big brother? And he said to me, he said, you have to fight. Fight, fight. He said, no matter what, you don't give up. He said, they told me prison was going to break me. And I said, you know what? No matter what they do to me, I will have to die on the floor of that cell before they break me. But I will not give up. Because as long as you do not give up, as soon as you give up, he said, it's over. You have no chance. But as long as you are fighting and you are not giving up, there is a chance, there is a possibility that you might win, no matter how overwhelming the odds are. And that affected me. So I share that with you, because I got that from him, because I know the odds seem overwhelming at times, because I know we have a fascist white supremacist running the country right now. There's no other way to put it. A fascist white supremacist misogynist hypercapitalist. All these terms actually apply, and they've applied before, but he's a bold face liar about it, and so I want to just put it out there if it's not already been said in the room, because those are the odds that are stacked up against us, but we understand the power, 
of, of David and Goliath. <laughs> we understand the power of the ants can conquer the elephant. We understand that all empires must come to an end. And so as we organize ourselves, I learned from Dolores Huerta that no movement can happen without organizing. And we are here in the process of developing our organizing, bringing ourselves together to actually challenge the system of empire that we're living under. And so in that spirit, I want to say I have faith, I have hope, I have belief that we will come together and actually bring this era of imperialism to an end. And that is the work that I see us as engaging. All I got is some fish and a few loaves of bread and a whole lot of folks have got to get fed. All I got is some fish and a few loaves of bread and a whole lot of folks to feed. But if seven seas were made in under seven days, if the first man was forgiven when he misbehaved, if a twig was taken from a tree by a dove to a boat that was built before a flood, if a tower was being built to prove who the man was, when suddenly people were speaking in tongues. If a rainbow was erected to send out the sign that the world would get wet with the fire next time. If someone was told to sacrifice his own son, then told to hold up just before he was done. Then the fish and the bread that I just said is all that I got. It's all that I need for me to get fed and for me to feed a whole lot of folks in need because they set me on fire when they look back i was chilling with my brothers shadrach and meshach i threw down with an angel all through the night then got him to bless me when i won the fight then i had to fight like 10 older brothers for jack and my triple fat goose in many colors and i had this dream they hated about them bowing to me so they sold me out to a band of bandits who later on landed near where the water when they was commanded to stop drop for blowing the stop up into this ship I was in when I got this here fish that I found while fishing around underwater with the daughter of the pharaoh once found. The child who was chosen to force the pharaoh to free his folks from a foreign land or prepare for plagues all across the land. Prepare every woman, prepare every man, prepare every child. All you got is that rod in your hand. All you got is that rod and the guy he don't know how the hell you gonna get pharaoh to let us all go. All I got is some fish and a few loaves of bread. And a whole lot of folks have got to get fed. All I got is some fish and a few loaves of bread and a whole lot of folks to feed. But I believe, I believe I can part the sea now and then and then put it back together again. I believe I can kill any giant dead if I believe in my heart. I'd bust him upside his head with a stone that's his throne from the sling. I would cling before we were crowned. Back when we were kings, back when we were able to see prophecies as a whale is gonna save your son. Just jump in the sea, a holy woman was no hope cause she conceived immaculately. And a good baby daddy was something even God could be. We could heal the sick and we could make the blind see. Miracles wasn't profit motivated like the medical industry. We believed in believing, so I believe in belief. And I believe faith could come in the night like a thief and knock out each of us uncertainty's teeth and take away all of your disbelief because the faith that forced Pharaoh to end slavery tells me it's about time my people was free and the faith that outlived leprosy is a faith that will outlive HIV the faith that won us that last presidency because a faith that gets mountains up out of bed is a faith I believe is able to spread a few little fish and a few loaves of bread to feed all the folks who got to get fed I believe I can make wine out of tap water and I believe I can tap tango, break dance, and walk on water. And I believe the children are the future. We should teach them well and let them lead the way. And show them all the beauty they possess inside. And give to them a sense of pride. And I believe I can fly. I believe I can soar. See me running through that open door. Believe it or not, I'm walking on air. Never thought I could be so free. But I believe in flying away on a wing and a prayer. Who could this be? Who could this be? Believe it or not, it's just me. But believe it or not, I'm just we, and believe it or not, the fish that we got, and the bread that I said is all that we got, it's all that we need, for us to get fed, and for us to feed a whole lot of folks, a whole lot of folks, a whole lot of folks in need. When I say black and brown, somebody say power, black and brown. 
black and brown. When I say spoken, somebody say words spoken, spoken. When I say hip, everybody say hop, hip, hip. Somebody scream. You're in for a very special treat. I want to introduce to y'all a good friend, a sister of mine, a brilliant radical voice who's making noise from coast to coast and around the world. She is the Chicana from down under, not to be messed with. She wanted, one of a kind, one in a million. Every once in a while you, read, you connect with somebody, you're like, yo, that person is just on my wavelength. I need to work with you, I need to build with you. Please put your hands together for Maya Jupiter! I'm so cold. Make some noise for Breon Bain. Yeah, yeah, you. Yeah. This song goes out to all my phenomenal women in the place. Breon wanted to do this track with me today. Yeah. He said, let's liven up the place. I said, all right. Yeah. Can we turn the volume up a little bit? Turn it up, turn it up, turn it up. Y'all for respect me. Don't pull around now, where's my time? I am a lady, 36, 24, 36, age mine. Best reckon I, yeah, 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 yeah. It's my Jupiter standing tall. Keeping my head high, yeah, 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 yeah. This woman is phenomenal. Bye bye, in a silly gal head. Teeth a lion, plus she rained dead. Can't mess around me, my mind well fed. Never waste time, and time is my bread. Who am I? The M A Y A Maya, queen of the dance, so hot like fire. fire. Been around the world, I am frequent fire. fire. This my empire, fire, fire. Ease, Ease up. up. I'm a queen with an attitude, not personal. I am attitude. Ease, Ease up. up. You can see it when I walk, hear it when I talk, cause I came to rock. Ease, Ease up. up. So much confidence. After the show, give us compliments. Ease up. Una fina Latina, skip the colada, dame la yeah, amor. Respect, respect me, gee, 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 gee. Yeah. Don't yeah. move around now, where's my time? Come on. I am a leg, gee, 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 gee. 36, 24, 36, age mine. Best reckon I, yeah, 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 yeah. Maya, Jupiter, standing tall. Keeping my head high, yeah, 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 yeah. This moment is phenomenal. Willie Valentine, get them a run. Bad girl fall with the party can't done. Dusty wire, red hot like sun. Take for yourself, protect your gun. Brrr, no more shooting in the streets. Brrr, I'll leave your same retreat. Watch out when the devil come near. Trinidadian, Trinidadian, come. Woo! Trinidadian, Trinidadian, come. Woo! Trinidadian, Trinidadian, come. When we come like the sun, Babylon must burn. Pump your fist if you're down to resist these come new on. world order imperialists and the accomplices on the premises. Terrorists like, like they patriots. Come on. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Where's my time? I am a leg. I'm warm. You know, sometimes we got to have fun and celebrate all the good things and, and uh, enjoy. But, you know, this next song is not that. <laughs> this next song is about when you get really, really angry. And uh, this is a song called Crumble that I co-wrote with Quetzal Flores from the band uh, East Los Chicano Rock Band. And, um, and it's really about, um, I don't think that there's room for reform in this system anymore. We're talking about the school to prison pipeline. I mean, having a police department, a school police department, makes no sense. Um, and I really think it's about just kind of tearing the whole thing down, rebuilding. So the song is called Crumble. The art is by political cartoonist Lalo Alcaraz. Slave labor, poor kids lose. Walk around the neighborhood and see cops cruise. Hunting, looking for a new suspect. Lock them in a cell to collect the next check. Three strike rule means kids out of school. Straight down a pipeline for a lifetime. Military guns held by fools. Never can win when it's designed to lose. Girl beat down cause she had a cell phone. Boy cat back, now he's in a group home. No need to look around the world to know it's strange when a cop kills a kid at point blank range. Block by block, fill the city rock. Tension, release, no justice, no peace. <laughs> Fire, you win, crush. Oh, 
integrity in your uniform. Fuck your bullets and your gunpowder. We won't keep quiet. We only get louder. Little by little, grassroots grow trees. Spread like bush fire until you can't breathe. Never gonna stop until you're on your knees. Yeah, you take a my son won't get past me. Ooh. Block by block, feel the city rock. Tension, release. Come on. Fire, blue, crush. Jupiter, make some noise! When I say black and brown, you say power. Black and brown, black and brown. Somebody scream! Yeah! Ha <laughs> ha! Nanya, how you doing? You doing all right? Emotional. That's what's up. Okay, so we got, you know, black and brown folks, we recognize our ancestors on a daily basis, and everybody really should. If you uh, don't have any ancestors, you can be quiet for this next joint. <laughs> I gotta share this because it's a little bit of a ritual, and I need, I need your help. We need your help getting this going. So, uh, you know, my barber back in Brooklyn says, you know, we always talk about the, the uh, early bird gets the worm, but we never talk about how the second mouse gets the cheese, right? Second mouse gets the cheese. First mouse comes up, goes to the track, <coughs> neck all broke up. First mouse comes up, oh, sucks to be you, keeps it moving. <laughs> all of us are like the second mouse because we're all here because somebody put their neck on the line for us to be here. Are you with me? Yeah. Are you with me? Yeah. Okay, if you're with me, then over here, if y'all alive inside of the room, who really gets to make some noise? Yeah. If y'all don't know what the hell they talking about over here, make some noise. So when I say, what is, what, we're going to do this in F sharp? Yeah. All right, so I'm going to say, I know they watching. I need y'all to say, ancestors watching. Can y'all do that? Yeah. I know they watching. Ancestors watching. Can y'all do better? Yes, my side can do way better than let's your see, side. Let's see, let's see, let's see. All right, all right, all right. So I know they watching. watching. Let's have y'all say, I know, I know. All right, try that. One, two, three. I know, I know. It's they close, Ma it's close, Maya. It's, let's try it again. I know they watching. I know they watching. I know, I know. Okay, yeah, let's, put yeah, 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 let's put it together. Let's put it together. Let's see. Let's see who's going. Who's going to take this? All right. Let's just keep. I, let's this, just speed it up. Okay, here we go. <laughs> I know they watching. Ancestors watching. I know they watching. I know, I know. Everybody. I know they watching. Ancestors watching. I know they watching. I know. I know they watch. I know they watch. Sing it all together. I know they watch. I know they watch. I know, I know. The world ain't the way it's supposed to be, but I know they watching over me. Trouble keep coming close to me, but I know they watching over me. You see, I know they watch. I know they watch. I know, I know. I know they watch. Watching. I know they watch. I know, I know. I organize a Marcus Garvey, get nice with Bob Marley. Ride the Harlem with Harry and Tubman on the Harley. Seek truth with Sojourner, teach truth with Nat Turner. On the block with Shaka Zulu locking and loading the burner. Home is a war zone, fuck what you heard. Police shoot to kill and go chill in the burbs. Bury the same brother, used to serve him herb. And got the nerve to say, nigga got what he deserved. And then it's back on the prowl, the system's foul. Storm the White House, y'all, the time is now. So I'm calling on the spirit of chain Malcolm and Mal. Frida Kala, Queen of Zinga, bring Babylon, Babylon down. down. The world ain't the way it's supposed to be, but I know they watching over me. Trouble keep coming close to me, but I know they watching over me. You see, I know they watching. Ancestors watching. I know they watching. I know, I know. I know they watching. 
know they watching. I know they watching. I always told my grandmother hardly miss protection. A world apart, but there was no stopping her perfection. Now she's fast, but I still feel a deep connection. Always making sure I'm heading in the right direction. I wanna protect the water in on daughters like Berta. Learn from the Zapatistas and lead like Ramona. Have enough courage to fight like Petra and reclaim my land like Toy Perina. When I see my eyes, I think of all the women who fought with their bare hands from the very beginning. The ones that we don't even know their names. But they sacrifice their life without any acclaim <laughs> and it's still going on to this day. If you look around, you see nothing's changed. An activist, equal rights, and protester that just made Marielle an ancestor. That's right. I know they watching, ancestors watching. I know they watching. I know, I know. I know they watching, ancestors watching. I know they watching, I know one. You see, now a nigga know how the natives felt. TP's getting whipped with a Bible belt. Move till the ice melt. Now we can't come back. And treaties we received it and mentioned that. Now my home is stolen and your boat is swollen. Me and my village never volunteered to do no rowing. Where on earth we going? Who the hell these Romans? Why you watching my sister like her ass is glowing? Hell no, officer. You can't inspect my colon. We was just chilling here doing our own thing. Y'all came along claiming land for your king. Put a copyright ride on a song canary sing started cutting off bones in the name of bling like ancestors from texas to the west indies shot town to oak town philly to fort green east to west it's the next manifest destiny i know they watching ancestors watching i know they watching i know i know i know they watching ancestors watching i know they watching i know i know on the moment the cheery up became politicized like the second that angela became radicalized on the intention of being Building, shot across the border. I am Diana's gun, restoring all the order. I'm not lean, and I'm at the head of the struggle. I am Vandana, and Monsanto is in trouble. I am fierce, ferocious, and furiously strong. I am Mother Earth, and this is my song. I said, I know they watching, ancestors watching. I know they watching. I put them up, y'all. I know they watching, ancestors watching. I know they watching. I know. One more time. I know they watch. Ancestors watching. I know they watching. I know, I know. I know they watching. Ancestors watching. I know they watching. <laughs> Give it up for John B. Williams on the bass.